This is the new Ascar 185 Apo Refractor. And the timing of this review couldn't be better because when Ascar reached out to ask me to test this, I just put up the walls on my observatory and the observatory has been super helpful in testing a telescope this massive. To give you an idea of the size of this, here is the front aperture side-by-side -side comparison with the Ascar 130 PHQ, which is previously the biggest refractor I've ever used. Here is the length comparison. And as you can see uh, in this comparison, the 185 with the uh, camera attached in the right focal position just barely works with my observatory floor uh, when pointed at Zenith. If I was doing visual with this telescope, it would I would have to have a much taller pier to get it a comfortable uh, viewing position seated. But if you do get past those hurdles, is it worth $4,800 if you're an astro imager with the right kind of setup for it? That's what I'll be addressing in this video uh, by giving you my impressions, of course, and then imaging test results uh, from using this gigantic refractor over several nights over the past month. Hey, my name is Nico. I'm interested in all kinds of astrophotography, but personally, my specialty is deep sky imaging. And this is a review of this telescope, so I'll start with a couple disclosures. This Ascar 185 APO was sent to me by Ascar for review. It's a telescope that's currently still a pre-order item, but should be available very soon. The ZWO 6200 cameras uh, were uh, lent to me uh, from ZWO, and I think these are probably the best cameras for testing optics today because they have the small pixels but full frame sensor, which is a really deadly combination. It really puts these optics to the test. Um, so thank you to Ascar and ZWO. And I should point out that neither company has any input into what I say in this review. This is an independent review. So let's start with the basic properties and design of this telescope. This is an APO triplet refractor in Ascar's fairly new APO triplet line, which includes a 103, a 120, a 140, and now the 185. The idea with this product line is affordable APO triplets, each one with uh, matched flatteners and flattener reducers, and then they can be used as visual instruments as well as for astrophotography. And yes, I did say affordable for a telescope retailing at 5,000, about 5,000 US dollars. And I'm sure many of you are asking, how is that affordable? Well, try comparing this to other APO triplet refractors at this aperture. And when you do that, you'll see that this is actually incredibly low priced compared to the competition on the market today. Now, I am not saying that uh, this telescope is as good as those more expensive ones. I don't have those here to test, and I know that they use different uh, types of glass, for instance, and things like that that justifies the price. I'm only pointing out that for its category, a 7-inch triplet Apple refractor, it's the most affordable option out right now, by far. And I'm sure many people will be thinking, but that's just refractors. What about other kinds of telescopes that you can use for imaging at this aperture or similar aperture, like Newtonian reflectors, catadioptric scopes like schmidt cassegrains And sure, if you want to expand this to you know, reflectors and other types of telescopes, you can find much more affordable options. But of course, with trade-offs. And one of those trade-offs being that it's hard to find telescopes less expensive at this aperture that are actually well corrected for imaging with a full frame sensor, which of course is gonna be one of my tests uh, that you'll see in this video. And there is a number of other trade-offs uh, because there's a lot more to telescope design than just the aperture. But uh, back to the 185, it comes packaged with a hard-sided case with wheels on the outside, of course, and then it has custom-cut foam on the inside. It also comes with a top handle, very nice uh, machined rings, and a substantial 400 millimeter uh, Lasmandi plate. The focuser is a three and a half inch uh, rack and pinion style focuser. There are optional accessories like a 1x flattener and a 0.8x reducer flattener. Um, those are most you know, useful for imaging. And to install one of those, you just take off the visual back and screw in the flattener. From there, you can use uh, the back uh, threads, 48 millimeter threads. You just need 55 millimeter back focus to your camera sensor. So I'm using a ZWO camera here. I just use uh, the spacers that are included and that gets me to 55 millimeters. 
uh, most cameras will, will come with spacers or, or connection diagrams at least to help you get to that 55 millimeter back focus. The telescope itself uh, with the rings and the dovetails weighs about 38 pounds or 17 kilograms. With a guide scope and flattener and astronomy camera attached, it weighs 43 pounds or 19 kilograms. So that's right on the edge of the payload limit for this Skywatcher EQ6R mount that I did use for testing. It has a payload limit of 44 pounds, so just one pound off. I did use four 11 pound counterweights, and ideally this is, I gotta say, not the right mount for imaging with this telescope because a good rule of thumb is not to max out your payload limit for imaging with any uh, equatorial mount. I did have pretty good results though. And I think a big part of that is I was imaging from a concrete pier inside an observatory with uh, walls that are about seven feet tall. And so you have both um, wind block, but also a ton of concrete going four feet into the ground that's really providing a stable foundation for the mountain telescope. So without that, I think I would have had a lot more problem with this mount. I would have needed a beefier mount and probably a portable pier for this. The reason I suggest a portable pier is that with a telescope this long, you're gonna have a lot of problems uh, with running into the legs if you're using a normal tripod. And if you're a visual observer, uh, I don't have any really specific advice other than your mount and tripod or pier or whatever is gonna to have to be quite tall to use this even seated. Okay, in terms of the build quality, I think this seems to be very well done. The fit and finishes are all very nice. I haven't found anything loose or strange um, in visually inspecting and trying all the different uh, connections and things like that. Like I said, it does have a top handle here, which doubles as a place to attach accessories like a guide scope. The back of the telescope here is contracted with this retractable tube. Um, it's fully, you know, contracted for storage and then also if you want to use the scope with a bino viewer. For imaging, other uses, you're going to extend this part all the way out with this captain's wheel. The focuser is very nice, it's a three and a half inch uh, rack and pinion with a 10 to 1 reduction knob, dual speed of course. And it, on the back, on the bottom, it has the holes for mounting electronic focuser. On the focus travel, it shows both markings in indicating how far the focuser is extended and rotational markings here for the manual rotator. The total length of the telescope with the flattener and the camera attached, the extension out, the dew shield extended is five feet, two inches or 157 centimeters. The included case is 47 inches long by 14 inches wide by 15 inches high and I'll put the metric equivalents up on screen. It does fit in the back of my current car, which is a Subaru Crosstrek with one of the back seats down. The specifications for imaging on this are 1295 millimeter focal length at F7 with the 1X flattener, 1036 millimeter focal length at F5.6 with the 0.8X reducer. And again, both of these, uh, the flattener and the flattener reducer are optional. They're $300 each. You're gonna wanna pick up at least one if you're doing imaging. If you're using it as a visual telescope, you won't need those, which is why they're optional. And now my favorite part of this review is actually evaluating the images that I took with this telescope. So let's jump on the computer and check those out. Okay, this first test is a video, obviously. It's something I wasn't even planning on doing, but I was looking at the moon with the telescope uh, through a nice Explore Scientific eyepiece, and I was really impressed by the view, one of the best lunar views I'd ever seen. And so I just decided I'm gonna swap in my camera, my Canon RA, and take a quick video here. And I think it looks pretty good. Uh, this is, the Canon RA has a 4K crop mode, meaning it just takes 4K from the middle of the sensor. Um, and this is at the full, uh, resolution of the telescope 1295 at f7 and you know you can see that there's some uh air currents astronomical seeing moving across the surface of the moon there and i'm not a lunar imaging expert so if there are any lunar photographers that want to leave a comment and let me know what you think of this uh, i'd be really happy to know but uh it's definitely detailed and uh, no false color uh, or color fringing that i can see but I'm more of an expert on uh, deep sky imaging. So let's go over to PixInsight here and take a look at some of the tests that I did. So this first uh, image you're seeing here is just a single sub, a four minute sub exposure with the 1X flattener and the ASI 6200 MC, that full frame uh, camera. And this is a good uh, test just to see the vignetting. 
here is the flat and you can see it matches well against this so the the flat completely takes away that vignetting for anyone that wants to see the stars from a single sub exposure this is what they look like you can see that the corners look pretty good here in terms of star shape people are always asking me to show this so i'm going to indulge uh people who, who want to see this. Uh, the reason I typically don't show these numbers is because they can be very easily misinterpreted because uh, you it's sort of a black box. You don't know how much is going to be mount performance versus your sky conditions and all these different factors that go into this. But in any case, uh, the full width half maximum, uh, the median uh, value was 4.4 pixels. And so at 0.6 arc seconds per pixel, that's something like 2.6 arc seconds uh, in terms of the full width half maximum. The eccentricity, uh, we have a median of 0.39. I believe uh, PixInsight says that anything under 0.42 is going to look uh, perfectly round, uh, or it's not gonna look noticeably out of round at least. So these seem like reasonable values to me but uh if you if you want to disagree feel free in the comments uh, i'm not going to talk too much about the numbers okay and then here is a single with the reducer and if we go back to the flattener you can see that the vignetting is um, quite a bit more with the reducer than it is with the flattener which is to be expected and you can definitely see that here in this uh analysis with the uh, the dark corners. Here is the full width half maximum and eccentricity. Um, here we have a slightly lower pixel value median for the full width half maximum, but since we changed our image scale, this is actually a slightly worse result. It's a three arc second full width half maximum. Well, remember the other one was 2.6. And then um, the eccentricity is actually slightly better, 0.37. Well, I think the other one was 0.39, but again, anything below 0.42 and you're golden. Here is 10 sub exposures, 10 four minute sub exposures stacked together and just auto stretched. And you can see with the flats, we now have uh, you know a nice flat field, no problems with vignetting in the corners. And here is the stars and so what i want you to note here is that if you look at the star shapes they're pretty good um, in all of these different squares so these are the extreme corners and this is the center and you can see that the star shapes look pretty much the same whether you're in the corners or in, you're in the center and that's something Ascar is really good at is is getting really nice performance in terms of star shape across a large field, in this case, a full frame sensor with small pixels. Okay, and compared to the one with the Fladner, again, um, very nice job. All the uh, stars look pretty good. I will say that there's a little bit more of this like little uh, flare effect. You can see it very slightly with the Fladner, but then with the reducer, it's a little bit more obvious. Um, on some of the corner stars, some of the bright corner stars with the reducer. That's really minimal though. I've seen much, much worse than that. I mean, in terms of star shapes, this is pretty amazing. I, I have nothing to complain about here. Now, uh, that's star shape. Now, the other big thing that we look at when we are examining stars with telescopes here is, is chromatic aberration. I just took my 10 uh, sub stack and I really saturated it, both for the flattener and for the reducer here. In both cases, I think that at this 100% um, zoom view, I really don't see any problems. Now, if we want to really, really pixel peep here, we can do the mosaic view on these um, blown up details. And even then, I don't really see much of an issue. But if you zoom in on these, like if you really want a pixel peep, let's zoom in here. Okay, now you can see a little bit of this sort of um, color split, which is suggesting there's going to be um, issues with chromatic aberration if you really want to pixel peep it. 
And so what I'm seeing here is see how these stars, both in the reducer and in the flattener version, they're blue on the top, but then warm color, I don't know, sort of a yellowish, reddish color on the bottom. This is an extreme test though. I wanna make that clear. You might, if, you, if you're not someone who really saturates your stars and really wants to just get those really colorful stars, you might never even see this. Um, but it, it, it is a display of, of chromatic aberration if you really want to um, pixel peep the data there. Okay, and so that's all sort of the imaging tests that I wanna show with this telescope. Now I just wanna show some of the processed things that I created. This is the first thing that I, I wanted to create, which is just a detail in on the elephant trunk with the F7 data. And I was really happy with this. To, to see this amount of detail is pretty cool. I've never had a telescope, I think, that showed this much detail on uh, the, these cool little reflection nebulae in the uh, core part of the elephant trunk here. Like this is a nice little like yellow reflection nebula with the HA emission sneaking through the keyhole there. And then this blue reflection nebula, you know, it at lower focal lengths, that just sort of turns into like a little blob. But here you can see the the contours and ridges of it. I just think that looks really neat. So that's really zoomed in. That's a really small detail. Here is the full HA RGB shot. This is about two and a half hours. So one hour of H alpha data and then one hour, 20 minutes with the one shot color. I also did um, some uh, mono with this. So HA, S2, and O3 to give you a full narrowband look at the elephant trunk with this telescope. This was with at F7 with the flattener. For some reason, I, I'm more drawn right now to the HA RGB, to the, to the more true color. Uh, ever since I've moved out here to the Bortle 3 area, I guess, I guess I've sort of not been as into narrow band, partly because I did a lot of narrow band when I lived in the city. Uh, so, so now I'm more into the, the true color kind of imaging. So I liked this shot, but I just found it a little bit boring because I've done shots like it before. So what I did with this one is I cropped it and then did a little further processing on the crop. And that's sort of my final image for this video that I, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, making this image. It's the kind of image I've never created before because it's just really zoomed in details on, on a familiar target to me, a target that I've shot dozens of times, but never in this kind of detail. And so that's exciting to me. And it makes me excited to try out this telescope a little bit more bec uh, because it's it's really fun, I think, to, to shoot this zoomed in. And now that I have the observatory, it's a lot easier to, to use a telescope this big. So that's it for this one. Hope you enjoyed it. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies. <laughs>